on this earth. Isn't that amazing? Now, you look at that sometimes. I look at it sometimes. Sometimes we get to big cities and we have these seminars. I was in Newark, New Jersey not long ago. And you would drive home at night and you would literally see millions and millions and millions of people. And I would cry going home with my wife. I'd say, honey, how in the world are we ever going to reach these people for Jesus? This system of Satan, the dragon, and the Antichrist and all of his teaching and all the false prophets teaching all those false things. It's so big, it's so overwhelming. This whole system of Babylon is just so established on this earth and so many people are so totally deceived. How are we ever going to break through it? But I'll tell you folks, I take comfort in one thing. God will. Amen? I want you to see how it happened in the Old Testament times. And then we're going to see how it happens for you and I in the very last moments of earth's history. We'll be done here in just a minute. But let's take a good look. Let's go to Isaiah for a minute. Back to Isaiah where we were earlier, I'd like to go to chapter 44. All right, and in Isaiah chapter 44, let's see how old Babylon fell. God raised up a man, his name was Cyrus, prophesied years in advance, by the way. And in Isaiah 44, God said Cyrus would be the one that would overthrow Babylon and set its people free. All right, we're going to Isaiah. What chapter did I tell you? Very good, Isaiah 44. And let's look together here, beginning in verse 27. Isaiah 44, 27, here's the prophecy. It says, That saith to the deep, Be dry, and I will dry up thy rivers. That saith of Cyrus, He is my what? My shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. Now let's pause here. This Cyrus is the one that overthrew Babylon. I'll tell you about it in just a minute. And God calls him the shepherd. Please tell me, who else in the Bible is called the shepherd? That's right, Jesus Christ. So he's typifying Jesus Christ. Chapter 45, the first verse, next one. Chapter 45, verse 1 says, Thus saith to the Lord, to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. Notice again, Cyrus is called the anointed. Who's the other person in the Bible that's called the anointed? Jesus Christ again. Cyrus is typifying Jesus. Now here's how it worked. You've got this huge kingdom called Babylon. It's a world reigning empire. Babylon was so strong, so powerful, and so mighty a kingdom, they said it will never fall. It's impossible. Look how big and mighty it is. The walls around the city of Babylon, folks, were so thick and so wide, you could literally race 12 chariots abreast of each other. It was impossible to get in that city. Not only that, this city had one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was the Hanging Gardens, and here's why. The river Euphrates flowed right through the city. It was its life support. They had all the fresh water they wanted. And you know what they did? Because of that, inside they had one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Hanging Gardens. And they grew all the food, all the produce, all the grain, everything they needed for survival, they grew inside the walls of the city. So you could get an army here to surround this thing for a hundred years. Wouldn't make any difference to them. They couldn't break down the walls because they were too thick. They had all the water they needed. They had all the food they needed inside the city. I mean, this place was so big and powerful, they said it will never fall. Never, ever fall. But God said, I'm going to raise up a man who's going to do it. And he says, I'm going to open before him the two-leaved gates. You see, folks, the only way into Babylon was through these two gates where the river flowed through right here. And so Cyrus, on the inspiration of God, one night when he knew Babylon would be in a holiday and in drunkenness and feasting, he laid his plan. Upstream of the river Euphrates, he dammed it. And he diverted it down another valley. He literally changed the course of the river. He took away its life support. And as the water began to flow another direction, it was a night, as I said, of a holiday and feasting and drunkenness. Then the rest of the water quickly ran out. Cyrus, being smart, took his army, and on this dry riverbed after the water had run out, he marched his entire army in through the two-leaved gates on this dry riverbed. Nobody saw him. Everybody was in feasting that night. The river was down there. Nobody was looking in the river. And when he got his entire army inside the walls of the city, just like that, within two hours, the entire city fell, and he conquered it, and it was over. They said it was impossible, but he did it. Amen? 
All right, folks, here's you and I sitting tonight. We look around us, and our hearts are heavy. My heart breaks, folks, as I look at the millions of people in deception. My heart breaks as I look at the millions of people in sin tonight in this city. I pray, God, give me a love for these souls. And when you look out here, folks, and you see this system of Babylon that is deceiving so many people, you see so many people following traditions of men. You see them following the teachings of Antichrist. And they don't even seem to care or even want to know. You see these millions of people deceived by the system of Babylon out here. Sometimes you just get to the place and say, God, how's it ever going to happen? How's it ever going to happen? Folks, God says, I'm going to do it. And there's going to come a rescuer someday for God's people. They're called the kings of the east. Who and what army is going to rescue us from this system of Babylon? Who's going to take us out of this mess, folks? I'm happy to tell you, there's an army that's going to do it. Revelation 19. Let's go there and see the battle of Armageddon. Revelation 19, we read this briefly the other evening, but now it's going to really, really come together. Revelation 19, let's begin in verse 11. Here's the army that will deliver God's people. Revelation 19, verse 11 says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. This is the battle, folks, the war of Armageddon. Verse 12, His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Who is that? That's Jesus. John 1.1 1, 1 says the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Here comes Jesus. Now we continue in the next verse. Verse 14. And the armies which were in the valley of Megiddo in the Middle East followed him upon white horses. Oops. Hold on. Let's try that again. And the armies which were where, folks? In heaven. Where is this battle taking place? It's in heaven, folks, over the throne of God. That's where the Mount of the Congregation is. That's where Har Moed is. That's where Armageddon is. That's where the battle's happening. Good and evil, God against Satan. Who's on the throne when this is all over? This is so powerful. The armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that's the word of God, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress and the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Folks, this is the wrath of God. God. This is plague number six. It's being poured out. Verse 16, And he honored his vesture and his thigh, and he written king of kings and lord of lords. Oh, I like that. i got to pause right here. Notice, he's not high priest anymore. He is no longer the one confessing us before the Father. He is king of kings. He's lord of lords. The priestly role is over. Now he's coming for his people. I love that. Can you say amen? That's powerful. Verse 17, And I saw an angel standing in the sun. He cried with a loud voice, saying, All the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast. Here's one of the characters in the Trinity of Error. I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken. And with him, the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he had deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. Ladies and gentlemen, I am happy to tell you, the trinity of truth blows away the trinity of error and casts him into the lake of fire. Thank God! Can you say amen? And by the way, folks, this is Jesus coming, the trinity of truth. That's the kings of the east. By the way, when Jesus comes, what direction is he going to come from? Yeah, the east. The Bible tells us as the lightning shines in the east, even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And folks, when Jesus comes in power and glory, it's all over. In fact, let's go back to Revelation 16. We're going to wrap it all up now. Revelation chapter 16, here's what happens. The final event. It ushers in the final plague. Revelation chapter 16, verse 17. This, oh, this, this verse is just so good. Look at it. It says in verse 17, And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice, out of the temple of heaven from the what? The throne. Guess who's on the throne? God is. Can you say amen? Oh, I just love this. Here's all the devil. I'm going to be on the throne of God. I'm going to sit in Armageddon. I'm going to, you know, be like the Most High. And he ends up in hell. And the beast ends up in hell. And the false prophets in hell. And God is still on the throne. Man, I like that thought, don't you? 
That's so awesome. Here comes Jesus now. He says, it's done. Verse 18. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake, such as there was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine and the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away. The mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasting God because of the plague of the hail. For the plague thereof is exceedingly great. Folks, it's all over. Jesus comes in power, glory. The cities are wiped out away. The dynasties expire. Hail comes down from God out of heaven. 65 pounds apiece. Can you imagine one of those in this church? It blew it apart, folks. And by the way, God's already got it made. Did you know that? You want to go read that? One of my best. I got to throw in one more text. It's okay. We can go a little bit over time. Let's go to Job real quick. This is my last text, I promise. Job chapter, uh, th uh, where is it? Job 38. And in Job chapter 38, you can read all about it. God's got the hail made. He's got it stored. He's got it ready to pour out. We're going to the book of Job. Where am I at? Oh, I'm in Psalms. No wonder. Job chapter 38. And let's look together here at one verse. This is so good. Job 38. Look at verse 22 and 23. Job 38 verse 22 and verse 23. God says, Hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow, or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail? which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war. That's the battle of Armageddon. God says, I got it made. He's got it stored up there somewhere in glory. And folks, he's got it ready to pour out. I'll tell you what, I want to be on God's side, don't you? <sighs> After this message and I, I for sure want to be on God's side. Sometimes people tell me, Leo, it's hard to be a Christian. It's hard to keep the commandments of God. It's hard to obey the truth of the Bible. I tell you what, folks, it ain't hard. It's easy. <laughs> the Bible says the way of the sinner is hard. I want you to think about it tonight. What's hard, folks, is when the first plague falls and your body is going to be covered with boils and blisters, oozing pus and blood, and you can't lay down or you scream in pain. You can't sit down or you scream in pain. You can't stand up. You're just in incredible pain with these open sores and boils and blisters screaming in your passion. Folks, that's hard. God's people, man, we're going to be walking around in perfect health, praising the Lord. That's easy. Amen. And then there's going to be this plague of blood, folks. Think about it. The wicked try to take a shower and blood comes out. They try to get a drink. Blood comes out. And with throats parched with thirst and bodies reeking of filth, they wander over this earth wishing to God they would have made their decision. Folks, you and I, our bread and water is going to be sure. That's easy. Amen? And then there's going to be a plague of the sun. I've gotten burned a few times, folks. I hate being burned. It hurts when you're burned. And men and women will literally be burned with that sun god where their flesh will be rotting off and dropping off. And with pain that is literally indescribable, they will wish to God they would have followed the truth. And folks, while they are being burned with their sun god, you and I can pull out our lawn chairs, put on the copper tone, sit back and enjoy the sunshine. That's easy. Amen? And there's coming a plague of darkness so intense, so awesome. The Bible says people will literally chew their tongues right out of their mouth. That's hard. You and I are going to be walking in the light of God's truth. That's easy. And then, folks, the battle takes place. I don't know about you, but I hate being a loser. I never want to lose at anything I do. I always want to win, no matter what. And the last thing I want to do is find out that I'm a loser on the last day. Amen? Amen. And folks, while well, the majority who thought that sin was the greatest way and traditions of men was wonderful and popular Christianity and doing everything that everybody else was doing on the broad road, all of a sudden they're going to realize, I have not walked in light. I have not been sealed by the Holy Spirit. And hailstones are going to come down and pulverize them. And folks, while the hail's coming down and while the earth is being shaken and while they are hopelessly lost and they realize I've lost it all, you and I are going to look up and say, man, this is my God. I've waited for him. He's going to save me. And God's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And folks, while the hail's coming down, we're going up. That's easy. I want to be there. Can you say amen? amen? If you want to be there, stand up tonight and be bold about it and say, yes, Lord, nothing will keep me back from entering the kingdom of heaven. And let's go and give God all the praise and glory tonight as we close. Father in heaven, this is an awesome message. It's a message that we don't even like to look at. And as we pause here in the quietness of this moment, we know that you don't want us to be motivated by fear. You want us to be motivated by love. 
But there's a reason you put this in the Bible for two chapters. And Father God, it's probably because as a loving parent, you sometimes see your children going astray and you have to give some severe discipline. Because as many as you love, you rebuke and chasten. Father, tonight I thank you for each person that settled it with Jesus, especially last evening. For all those who have the seal of God on their forehead tonight, I pray you would speak great peace and comfort to know that no plague will come near our dwelling. But Father, I know there are many here tonight. There's at least 17 or 18 that could have made a decision last night that didn't. I earnestly pray right now that you would speak to their hearts. Not in fear, but draw them with the cords of love. But Lord, help us to see that there's nothing on this earth we should hold on to. And that choosing sin and traditions of men and the teachings of Babylon is a very, very foolish choice that has consequences. Consequences that someday we'll look back and say, I wish to God I would have made a better choice. Help us to realize tonight, Father, the power of our decisions. That while you will not force us, you'll do everything possible to motivate us. And I ask now that your spirit would take this message and drive it deep into the hearts of those that are sitting on the fence. And right now, Father, may they make a decision. I invite them. You know who you are. Right now to say all to Jesus, I surrender. And then God, bring peace into each heart. May we leave here tonight with every heart totally in love with Jesus, totally surrendered, and totally sealed by your Holy Spirit. That on that day when Jesus comes and the plagues fall, not one here tonight would be missing, is my prayer in Jesus' name.